Hello everybody. There is a scene in a film called Thunderbird 6, the second feature-length adaptation of the much-loved children's 1960s TV show, in which Brains, the Thunderbird's head boffin, has got a group of executives in front of him and he says, Gentlemen, I have an idea for the future of transport. I'm going to build an airship. And they all laugh him out of the room. He later does go and build an airship and it uh, all goes horribly, horribly wrong. Why do I mention this? Well, because I imagine a few years ago, a similar scene must have taken place at Mazda when the executives all gathered round, as executives like to do, and they said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a bit of an issue. This whole electric thing is coming at us and we don't really have all that much. What are we going to do? And someone piped up and said, don't worry everybody, I've got the answer. It's diesel. But unlike in Thunderbird 6, where they were laughed out of the room, evidently everybody else went, hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, good idea that. And there are just two questions that I have. Firstly, what were they smoking and where can I get some? And secondly, has it worked? This is the all new Mazda CX-60 and it's a very interesting car. <laughs> The X3 size CX60 is currently the largest car available to Mazda's customers here in the UK. If you're looking for something bigger or with seven seats, unfortunately for Britons, you're going to have to look elsewhere. But for everybody else currently on the hunt for a new upmarket all wheel drive car, this does have a lot to offer. And much like the last press car I had from Mazda, the 3, it is equal parts brilliant and baffling. Let's begin by talking about the powertrain options, shall we? Because that likely is what's piqued your interest. And there are essentially two for the CX-60, both of which are notable in their own way. The first, and I suppose by today's standards, the most conventional is a two and a half litre plug-in hybrid that makes 327 horsepower, making it the most powerful road going car the firm have ever sold. And then you have this, an all new 3.3 litre straight six, as it's keen to remind you on the side of the car, diesel engine, which is available in two flavours. The base exclusive trim models can have a 200 horsepower variant that drives just two wheels. The rear ones go Mazda. And in that, plus the higher trim levels, including this, the top of the line Takumi, you can have it as a 250 horsepower version driving all four wheels. That then makes 550 newton meters, which is about 405 pound foot of torque. Mazda claim that through their research, they have managed to make this a relatively clean and efficient engine. It is paired with a mild hybrid 48 volt system for increased efficiency, and it also has an unusually low compression ratio for a diesel, just 14 to one versus the 16 to one of the old engine. They claim this improves amongst other things, NOx emissions considerably. In the time that I've had the car, it has done a genuine 43 to 44 MPG, kind of regardless of how I've driven it. And I've got to say, I really do like Mazda's approach when it comes to powertrains because they've built this engine on account of the fact they said there are still lots and lots of customers out there for whom it's the right choice. Good on you, Mazda. There is only one gearbox available for the car, their Skyactiv Drive branded 8-speed automatic, which they make some fairly bold claims for, but we'll discuss that more when we're out on the road. Before then though, I'd like to draw your attention to the exterior of the car. And at this point in time, I'd love you to hop into the comment section and tell me if you think it's a looker or not. Where the previous car I had, the Mazda 3, I think was genuinely pretty, this not quite the same. It makes a statement for sure, and I wouldn't go so far as to call it ugly, but it has a very different styling language. It's quite slab sided and I can't help but wonder if a few more pieces were colour coded, particularly the bottom trim, it might disguise some of the car's bulk. In any case, for me, a real highlight of this car is the interior. You see, anybody who hasn't set foot in a Mazda for a few years is going to get a shock when they open the door of this car. Because, simply put, 
I think it's spectacular. And it's in here that you'll find many examples of that simple Mazda genius from the likes of the gear lever here, which actually still moves. Love that. And the big info display up here that has all the things you'd expect it to. Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, and they work much better than in the uh, last car I had. Although um, after about two or three hours of driving, my Android Auto does start um, breaking the connection every now and again. I think it's because I'm using the wireless charging down here that you also get, and the phone is simply overheating. In any case, it was frustrating because my Shania Twain and Nickelback Megamix kept getting interrupted. But I digress. This screen is controlled by this physical selector down here with a few shortcut keys around it to help you navigate. Then to the side, you've got volume control, auto hold and park brake. It does frustrate that auto hold doesn't stay on because it's a feature I actually quite like. Then above the gear lever, you have a little toggle here for the me drive modes of which again, there are just three sport, normal, off-road and you don't really need any more then above that you've got a proper physical hvac system which is really easy to use very logical and hints at some of the many luxury features this car has including heated and ventilated seats up in the front there is also heating for the rear by the way which also has just about enough room for four decent sized adults the boot is very good too these front seats here with this trim also have electric adjustment plenty of it and memory settings down here as well you've got a digital display for the dash which is of course very common now but does just about everything you need it to although i would say it's still not the best in the business the steering wheel is lovely in the hand nice and thin very firm take note bmw and the selection of materials is fabulous. You have white Nappa leather, and if you go for the top of the line Takumi trim, this is how it's gonna be, by the way. This wood, which actually doesn't feel anywhere near as out of place as you might imagine. Then um, this stuff, whatever it is. I am not a fan of that. It looks nice, it feels a bit abrasive, but the reason I don't like it is that this is likely to be a family car. That's why you have Isofix and all sorts of stuff in it. But, um, I would not want to try and get ketchup out of that. I'd be very, very concerned as a parent buying this car. You've got plenty of storage, cup holders in the door and in the center here, below this beautifully actuated thing. Lots of room here in the middle too. And because it's not 2003 anymore, you don't even have the space for a Nokia 8810. Up top though, you do still have a sunglasses holder, but one thing I'm not keen on, that's, really flimsy but I'm willing to overlook that because it is a kind of journo gripe and I am not going to overlook the panoramic sunroof a 1000 pound option but one that Mazda recommend you take and I gotta agree with them the front section opens and although this car does have privacy glass it's not particularly strong and that means this is a beautiful light and airy feeling cabin if you've been watching all my Porsche videos lately or I've been ranting and raving about dark interiors well this is what I think a luxury car should look like. Sure, there are elements that I don't like. For example, when you've got the door shut here, there's a really big gap and it just looks naff, to be honest. But the gripes are generally few and far between. And the best bit, this car, 52 thousand pounds and that means that this is usefully cheaper than the Porsche Macan T which I drove a few weeks ago that is a car that had only about 15 horsepower more and certainly nowhere near as many features as the Mazda but of course the Porsche won many brownie points for the way that it drove is it the same here Well, perhaps predictably, it's complicated, but there is certainly plenty of good news, so we might as well start with that. And let's begin with the engine. This new 3.3 litre diesel, which really is an evolution of a unit they've had in production since 2014, is an absolute peach. Having driven so many cars in this category now, which are all, you know, essentially in the two ton club, but are powered by desperately desperately undersized or underpowered engines, little 1.6 turbo hybrids and the like, it's 
a revelation. It's so good to know that in this day and age, at a relatively affordable price point, this is not an 80, 90 grand car, somebody is still putting in the engine that the rest of it requires. This is a big car. It is relatively heavy. And so you want a powertrain which has plenty of torque, low down is more about that rather than the overall power figure and it works. Okay, so the 43 MPG average that I've been getting this week is 10 less than the 53 that they claim, but 43 is still miles better than just about any other press car I've had for quite some time. And that is a stark contrast to the McCann T, which struggled, struggled to get 27 or 28 on occasion. And that's a car which has only 15 horsepower more, but from a smaller and therefore you'd imagine more efficient two litre turbo petrol, essentially the engine out of the Golf. This, I think for most people, is a big thing. When you're spending 50, 60 grand, you are still gonna be concerned about economy because if you do 20, 30, 40,000 miles over a few years, it will add up. And this is exactly why Mazda have persevered with this engine because they've said they've still got loads of customers out there who can't just completely ignore things like economy because they can now say they've got a hybrid. It has to deliver the figures and this does. More than that though, it's actually a really nice engine. It's got fairly good pull from what feels like tick over, even at just under 1500 RPM, it goes well. And to know anybody who's driven a BMW with their three litre twin turbo straight six is likely to be a little bit unimpressed, but this does the job. It's never felt underpowered at any point in time. I'm really, really impressed with it. The gearbox though, less so. Mazda makes some really, really big claims about this Skyactive drive system. On their website, they say it combines the best of a torque converter automatic, a dual clutch and a CVT, which is remarkable because those are three entirely different technologies. And uh, last time I checked the CVT didn't really have all that much going for it. Fortunately, this is not really like a CVT in just about any way that I care to imagine. Nor, though, is it really like a dual clutch. Mechanically, it's most closely related to a torque converter, and therefore, unsurprisingly, that is the one that it feels like. You can change gears yourself with the paddles behind the wheel that are actually pretty okay, but um, there's no point. It's not particularly quick to respond. It's not even quick in terms of shift speed. And the engine has such a spread of torque that honestly, being in exactly the right point of the rev range is just um, not a concern. So uh, that I wouldn't really call it a miss, but it's just um, a claim I think Mazda took a little bit too far. Visibility is very good. The bonnet does feel like it goes on for a lot longer than it actually does. So there's been a few times where I've been really concerned that I'm parked a bit too close to something, but actually I've got out and seen that it's fine. Having the 360 degree camera and all the parking sensors is very nice. That is part of one of the optional packs that you can have with this car. And unfortunately, some of the other stuff you get at the same time is a source of one of my major gripes with this car. As is the case with just about everything now, the CX60 is packed with the uh, safety tech. All sorts of sensors, warnings, things that go beep and try and save you from yourself. Now, just about nobody likes these customers and manufacturers alike, but unfortunately legislation dictates that certain things, like for example, your lane departure assist has to be active every time you start the car. And so the vast majority of manufacturers have now put in a little button in a convenient place so you can just press it and to get rid of it straight away. Unfortunately, in the CX60, to disable such a feature, you have to go into a menu, then into a sub-menu, then scroll down and then click and get rid of the thing. And you've got to do that every single time you start the car. It may sound like a very sort of Neanderthal type gripe. Oh, it's really difficult to turn off the safety features that are designed to keep me alive in the car. But the simple fact is, for many of the roads that I tend to frequent, they're not particularly wide and they aren't always fully marked, which means that you may have markings in the centre or perhaps the side. But in any case, there's a good chance your car is taking up a little bit more than half the road. And the net result is that you may want to be more towards the middle of the road than you might normally, and the car 
doesn't like that. It's constantly trying to go, no, 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 off to the side. And I have had a few occasions where cars in the past, not this one, but cars have essentially tried to push me into a hedgerow. And then you have your collision pre-warning. So this is the system where if it thinks you're about to drive into the back of someone, it will break the car for you. By default again, this is all on. There is a little switch down here, which you might think turns the safety features off, but I think all it actually disables is your blind spot warning. If that were customizable, it'd be very handy. And for once, I was so frustrated and so certain that Mazda, with all their nice, sensible, logical thinking, couldn't possibly have made it this difficult. I did actually consult the manual, and in there, I found lots and lots of information about what the safety features do, and nothing on how to easily turn them off. But the pre-collision assist, well, that about three or four times in the last week, because of where I live, you have lots of cars kind of bumped onto the pavement, so you drive up to them and then around them, it's just panicked and gone, oh, you're about to drive into the back of a car, and it slams the brakes on. And then, of course, some poor sat behind you who was being perfectly sensible and knew you weren't going to slow down because it was clear ahead, nearly runs into the back of your car. That is frustrating, and that's why I like these safety features to either stay off or, where that's not possible, be able to easily be turned off. This is a gripe I appreciate. Back onto more good news. The throttle and brake, both very nice indeed. In fact, the brake pedal deserves special mention. It's not overly light and overly servoed as many a modern pedal are. It's actually got a bit of firmness to it. Feels almost, and this is stretching it a little bit, race car-like i.e. it responds more to pressure than to travel. I know all brake pedals do, but this one feels like it a little bit more than most. OK, compared to an actual race car, it's still flimsy and woolly and everything else, but I really, really like it. The steering, likewise, it's a slow rack and there isn't masses of feel or feedback coming through it, but it's actually got a nice weighting. It does work in the bends and you do get just about enough sensation of what the rest of the car is doing. Unfortunately, there is one pretty big deal breaker with this car for me, and that's the ride. The dampers here are passive, and to be quite honest, the three driving modes, normal, sport and off-road, the differences between are very, very subtle indeed. I've tried both normal and sport extensively, and honestly, can't really detect much of a difference. I think possibly in sport the uh, coasting feature is disabled and maybe the gear profile is a little bit different but really changes are subtle at best. If the road surface is billiard table smooth, there are no potholes, imperfections, lumps and bumps, repairs, anything like that, it's perfectly fine, it's lovely. If anything, you could call it a little bit soft. But that is not an accurate description of the roads near me or um, just about anybody else I know, for that matter. This car fidgets. It's like a five-year-old child on a long journey. It just cannot stay still. It manages to find imperfections that I didn't even know were there. The whole time, it's just, you're going along and it's just, just doing that every single moment. It's infuriating, really, really infuriating. Perhaps the tyre and rim combination are partly responsible, but the fact is that these are the only ones you can have with the car, so there's really no excuse for it. Right, doing quite a bit of filming today, and uh, up ahead is Anthony in the Dad B9 with my good friend Ben from Dad Cars. I'm sure plenty of people out there will not at all be bothered by the quality of the ride, but look, it, this is not good enough for this kind of car. Simple as it should just be better. The Mazda 3 was exactly the same, so I know it's not an accident. This clearly is the way that Mazda like to set their cars up, and uh, perhaps they're just doing all their testing on Japanese roads, which I'm told are glassy smooth and perfect, like a racetrack. But ours here in Europe, and the same in America, they're not. There are other small details too, like the fact that the coast system doesn't work quite smooth enough either. For example, you're on the motorway at 70 mile an hour, it will every now and again just switch off 
the drive and it's imperceptible when it does that but when the engine kicks back in there's a moment of like oh when the whole thing reconnects to the drive and it's just a little bit jarring very frustrating truthfully in terms of the driving experience the mccann really does have this car beat just hands down but i wager that anybody thinking of a mccann was not thinking of a mazda However, a Kia customer might be, and this is a good point of comparison for potentially the Sorento, though that's available as a seven-seater and this isn't, or maybe the smaller Sportage, which is really in a different class, but in higher trim levels is near enough the same money as this, and that Mazda does give you quite a bit more. I enjoy the simplicity, the purity of the drivetrain. Yes, there is a hybrid element, but really it's not one you have to actively think about. I am actually quite keen to try the plug-in hybrid variant because that I think could have a lot going for it as well. But substandard ride aside, I have to say that the CX60 really has been a pleasant surprise because this feels like just about no other Mazda I've ever been in. And were you to make me guess, I would have said this was easily a £60,000 car. I know particularly here in Britain we're awful for just looking at the badge and going, oh, I'll be 30 grand here, it's Mazda. But um, no, I think we should really evolve beyond that. We should start looking at what manufacturers are actually giving us. We should demand value for money. And that, I think, Mazda have given us with this. So there we have it. That is a bit of a first look at the all new and very bold Mazda CX-60. It's not a perfect car, but I am really, really glad there are companies out there that are willing to take a gamble on what to some are simply outdated and outmoded ways of thinking, but to others are really a very, very logical way of doing things. Huge thank you to them for lending me the car, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.